evening and welcome to our virtual expo. It's been a crazy year and we are excited to have you. I'm Carrie Adams and I am the program director of the Silver Creek Leadership Academy. Lauren Cohn, the uh, instructor for the 12th graders, is here with me as well to introduce you to our evening. SCLA is the Silver Creek Leadership Academy. We are the focus program at Silver Creek High School in Longmont, Colorado, as part of the St. Brain Valley School District, and we teach kids leadership. We're excited to have you here with us tonight. And Lauren, how are you? Thank you, Carrie. Good evening. It's interesting because originally the expo event started out, we used poster boards. The kids were putting up trifolds in the cafeteria. Last year, we morphed into a situation where the kids were on stage and they were able to present live to a real audience. And now here we are essentially doing commercials and having this broadcast on YouTube. And the kids have spent so much time putting together these incredible commercials. I'm really excited to, for you to see them. Thanks, Lauren. It is really interesting to see how this event has evolved through the years. We are super, super honored to have the fabulous Gloria Neal with us this evening again as our guest host. Gloria is a former news anchor out of Atlanta and now serves as Denver Mayor Michael Hancock's Director of Public Affairs. She is great as she chats with our kids and we are so excited to have her. Lauren, I can't wait for you to tell us a little bit more about the people we can't live without in our projects and that's the mentors. Absolutely, Carrie. The mentors have been an integral part of our program, and they're chosen because they're an expert in their field, so they're able to provide the students real-world uh, guidance. Um, they provide support to the students, and they're able to really make sure that the students are moving through their project in a professional way. A big shout out to our mentors and a big thank you. So we really appreciate all the work that you have done. Tonight, we'll be here watching live with you. And if you have any comments, be sure to add them in the comment section and we will get back with you and respond. You can also email me at adams underscore carry at svdsd.org and I will get back with you and connect you with the kids, with their projects. If you'd like to volunteer or sponsor or do anything, just get with us. We'd love your support and we appreciate working with the community and partnering with you. Seniors and their projects will be presented in alphabetical order tonight. So with that being said, let's welcome our first senior, Sloan Alber, and her commercial as the SCLA Ambassador President. Welcome, Sloan. Sloan Albert being the SCLA Ambassador Program President. Talk a little bit about what it's like to be the president of this program. It's really exciting and also a little interesting right now, just with the whole COVID situation. Um, that's definitely been an extra hurdle. <laughs> it's been really good. It's provided a good opportunity for us to really focus on engaging with each other, you know, right. and like the communication aspect of our program, because it's been 
good up to this point, but it's definitely been something that we can work on. And this has been a good opportunity to kind of hone in on that just because, I mean, I haven't seen, we have so many new ambassadors this year and we lost so many last year that we kind of relied on and like we're in the groove of things and then COVID hit and things kind of went our whole world a different way <laughs> different exactly. direction and you know so. it's a big deal when i'm doing jazz hands let me tell you <laughs> the whole the whole yeah. thing changes the challenge that you face probably one of the biggest challenges of course was that lack of interaction but explain why that is such a challenge when you are trying to be an ambassador and lead a program like the scla ambassador program so as ambassadors we really focus on you know we're kind of the face of the program. <laughs> and so as, you know, playing that role, we really have to focus on engaging others, but also keeping them motivated to stay in the program, to volunteer for capstones, to get their volunteer hours, to be kind of a good example for, you know, our peers and other people and be a good representation of the program when we do go out and volunteer and things like that. And so, you know, it's with lot. COVID, it's, provided a good opportunity to kind of, you know, one thing we've kind of done to keep spirits up and keep that interaction kind of there, even though we're far apart is we've gone ahead and I made, um, you know, an individual birthday card for all of our ambassadors that I drop off on their birthday, just on the front steps. <laughs> and then we had each of our ambassadors create just like a little five to 10 second clip of yeah. them saying just a generic happy birthday, holding signs, party hats, you know, whole That's nine yards. Awesome. And we send that to all of our the SCLA members, just the kids in classes that they still get a little recognition and right. feel as though they're part of something even though they're sitting in their bedrooms at home. Right, because it's the little things. It is the little things. What has COVID or this pandemic in difficult time in our history, what has it taught you about yourself? About myself. Um I think a lot about my ability to persevere, I think, through some unexpected, um, rapidly changing conditions and environments and, you know, having a lot of people kind of relying on me to do things and kind of turning to me what we're going to do next and how yeah. we're going to handle the, you know, are we going to be in school? Are we going to be at home? Are we going to be able to do these events and reaching right. out to these kids and, right. you know, still engaging with other people? And that's kind of, you know, even though it's been a struggle, it's been a good opportunity to kind of, I think, not only prove to each other, but prove to ourselves that we're capable of quickly adapting, which is one of the things that we kind of, um, you know, say yeah. that we're good at as yes. a <laughs> program. And now we really have a chance to show it, I think. Yeah, no, that you will find uh, that is a great answer because, boy, has 2020 been a year of audibles for me. Let me tell you, like, <laughs> that wasn't the plan. What's the plan B? Let's call an audible. There is you know, no plan. That's right. <laughs> there is be. no plan. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Um, this particular ambassador program has really required that you dig deep. Is that safe to say? I think so. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. And so in your digging deep, um, and I know that many of your classmates and even instructors will probably describe you as a go-getter, somebody who's not going to be deterred. There is a life lesson in that. Do you and or have you made that connection that what you've experienced now is really in many ways giving you a leg up on any other student class, class year, because there's no way that they've had to face what this class has had to face. There have definitely been a lot of really unique life lessons that we've been able to learn. I think that's definitely a safe bet. And I think that one thing that, you know, I think a lot of people don't really, in a weird way, aren't fortunate enough to have this opportunity. You know, like there's not really anything we can do about it. So if we can just look at it in an aspect of, hey, we're getting the not so fortunate, fortunate opportunity to kind of learn from these things and experience something that's so unknown to so many people and so <laughs> new to everybody and just such unprecedented times that I think, you know, it's been a good opportunity for us to kind of, as you were saying, to dig deep and um, really learn more about ourselves and our, ourselves as leaders and ourselves, you know, what we can contribute to the program and that role that we kind of play, you know, 
through all of this. <laughs> Absolutely. How, and, I, and I, I've gone through this question in my head, which is why I hesitate, but why are you proud of the work that you've done as the president of this organization for this year? I think this year, especially, you know, it's been, um, like I was saying, just difficult to kind of connect with people and really see that you're impacting people. You know, like usually when we're volunteering and stuff, you see the numbers and the people and the outcomes. And right. the, even though there isn't quite as much feedback, even though, you know, it's limited, the feedback that we have gotten right. for our various projects and even just like the birthday things, you know, going back to that has been really um, impactful, I think. Well, you know, I would say to you, if you're changing, if you're making one person laugh in a day, you are making a difference, honey. Sometimes it doesn't happen by the clicks or by the views or by how many followers. All of that is mute. If you are able to reach one person, especially through this screen, you're doing some good work. Thank you. You are very, very welcome. Be proud of the work you've done this year because it's laying the foundation for something even greater. Last question. If you had to describe this year in one word, I'm going to ask you again, what would it be? <laughs> hmm. Oh, man. Mm. <laughs> and there are no wrong answers. And sometimes that makes it even harder. <laughs> I have, you know, I want to say, going back to the whole opportunity-ridden um, year, I think, but in a different way. There's a lot of change. So I guess maybe change or maybe opportunity or a mix of the both. <laughs> That's good. That is good. No, that is good because you could definitely say that we did b both of those. But through all this adversity came opportunity and the change. Change is always good. It definitely. is always good if you're if it's moving you to provide and to to do better than you did the day before. Um, that is always very good, especially we women, and we must stick together. Yeah, it's definitely provided a lot of opportunity for us to not only grow as leaders, but to, I think, build our character and kind of, um, you know, going back to the whole perseverance thing, just keeping our head down and looking <laughs> through until it, we, you know, <laughs> see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think. So. Well, I'm proud of you, lady. I'm Thank you so you much. You are very Thank welcome. You. Good job. Thank you. Up, we have Max Allen. Put a smile on a senior. Now that is really, really cute. Talk about your really the passion around this particular project. Yeah, so this project uh, it came to me with all like the quarantine that's going on. So one special fact about myself was growing up, I've always had both sets of my grandparents living within a mile of my house. So growing up, I have a really close relationship with both sets of my grandparents. And then now with all the COVID-19 stuff going on or when that started in the summer, um, I could really see the effect that it had on them and the isolation that they felt. Um, even at least they had each other, but I can't imagine the people at senior living homes who really, they just don't have any support. And that's where my project came from is because I've seen with my own grandparents the struggle that um, it's been. And I just really wanted to help some other seniors with that. And so talk about when you say not having that support and really seeing 
those effects. For those individuals who either one, did not have grandparents, or two, um, don't know their grandparents, share how important that is to have that connection, that bridge. Yeah, so I think for my grandparents, watching us grow up has been like their entire retirement, like their life is watching us do things. Like I play sports, I'm in band, so they come to my band concerts. And I think without that thing to do, like that um, support, I would say, um, it's just, I feel like, especially now, like I said, we're in quarantine, the isolation is just, it's a struggle. So I think the relationship for them, I think it's been really important with helping them uh, stay positive and just like be happy with their lives. And I think a lot of that comes from us um, being able to connect. Yeah. And living through you all. I mean, not only your parents being proud of you, but your grandparents are proud of you as well. Yeah. You know, and that makes a huge, huge difference. And so putting a smile on a senior on the surface, it is a play on words. You think a senior as in high school, but it's also as in senior citizen or as one senior citizen told me, we are no longer senior citizens. We are older adults. I said, excuse me and excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> so <laughs> important, right? Yeah, uh, I'm excited about this project. I'm uh, with all the passion behind it. I just think, uh, especially in our area, I don't see a lot of younger people that are able to connect with some of those older people and especially at like senior living homes. Um, I just think our senior citizens are, they just don't get the support that they need. So I'm excited to help. And in many ways, the respect that they need, but share a little bit about that importance, why it is that it seems many, not all, but many folks who are younger don't give them um, the respect and the, quite frankly, the reverence that they so richly deserve. I remember my parents always said to me, you know what, one day you too will be old if you're lucky because you don't get <laughs> old and stupid, <laughs> right? Meaning if you're old, you know some stuff, you're wise. And so talk and share a little bit about the importance of younger folks giving them their just due. Mm-hmm. I think one of the reasons why um, some of the younger people right now uh, don't give them that like that respect and that uh, care is just because they themselves don't have a connection or a relationship with their grandparents. So like, since I know mine, I mean, my grandparents, they're really smart. They've been through a lot. They always tell me stories. They can always relate. And I know that that doesn't apply to just my grandparents. It's all those elderly out there. And it, I, there's a lot to learn from them and I'm glad I've been able to share that relationship. And I think that some of the others, uh, the other elderly deserve to have a relationship with some young people. So what kind of activities are you doing to bridge that divide? Well, it's funny that you said bridge because I'm actually working with the bridge senior living and, and I've been talking to Sherry powers. Um, she's my mentor as well as, um, uh, my advisor at the bridge. And my goal is basically just to keep them entertained and keep them feeling like they have something um, that's keeping them going. So originally um, I was setting on doing monthly events to do basically anything that we can keep social distance and keep them support. And as these restrictions have come down recently, um, I've had to shift it a little bit. So what I'm hoping on doing right now is um, in the next couple weeks is, um, connecting with Sherry so she can connect with some of the seniors and get them to reminisce on their time in high school and tell stories to, um, us younger, uh, kids, us younger generation about, um, some of the stories that they remember when they were in high school and going to dances and, um, having a job, you know, going, yeah. doing sports. And I think, um, that was a, an idea that was, put out by Miss Adams. And I'm actually really excited in pursuing it for the next um, month or maybe two. Mm-hmm. And I, cause I know my grandparents love to tell stories yes. and it makes them feel young when they're thinking about all the, all the fun times that they had. Yeah. And I think telling stories about when we're at the same age um, can really help connect some of the younger generation with those how elderly. Old, how old um, or range of your grandparents? My mother would always say, you don't ask people their age. But how old in that sense, the range? And what are your grandparents' names? So my grandparents, I have Ed and Shirley Allen, 
and they're I actually don't know the exact uh, ages, but they're between seventy and eighty. That is absolutely and then, wonderful. I think it's outstanding. <laughs> Yep. And then I have um, Bob and Joan Orr are my other set of grandparents and they live uh, and they're also between 70 and 80. Well, here's what I'm sure they know um, how proud of you they are, but you should also be proud of them. If you had to sum up the year 2020 in one word, Max, what would you say that word is? Uh, I'd say flexible, mm-hmm. at least for us. Like you really have to be be able to adapt and move along with the the shots that are taken. Absolutely. You have done that very, very well. I don't know what you plan on doing, but this is, um, this is definitely in your wheelhouse. Um, You do very well with this. Thank you for all you're doing, Max. Thanks. You're welcome. Good job. Twenty twenty has been a rough year. With so many horrible things happening, it's revealing how inspiringly good people are. People demonstrate their unconditional love for strangers facing 2020 challenges through donations of food, shelter, and their own time. Because of taboos on the topic of periods, menstrual products are under no name. Hi, I'm Kat Croft, and I'm passionate about Silver Creek Supports the Girls. We work with national organization I Support the Girls to provide women with feminine products unavailable to them otherwise. Having these essential supplies gives women the support they need to thrive in life. I want all women of Longmont to have this opportunity. This year, the need has become even greater. Donations of bras, funds, and menstrual products can make a real difference 2020 has proven we are all capable of. Kat Prof, I have read and looked at what you were doing, and it is so many times in life, the basic things, the things that most people don't even think about, that we need the most, that most people would not even give a second thought to because one, they would think that, well, of course they've got this, or maybe some other kit, some other thing. I was talking to a legislator who was saying she had recently found out, this was last year, but we followed up this year. She had found out that women in prison were not getting um, tampons and things to help them through their menstrual period because that wasn't a part of their goodie packet. And but yet and still men were getting the stuff that they needed in, you know, the shaving and the blah, blah and all that stuff. And she was like, stop the presses. If I got to pass legislation that says, hey, women who are in prison can have these or incarcerated, I should say, can have these in the bathroom without having to pay anything. You need these things. Full stop. And it took legislation in the state of Colorado to get that. Your project dealing with menstrual products for women experiencing homelessness or who are challenged when it comes to finding a place to stay, it is so beyond important. It is the bare necessities. How did you arrive at this, Katie? Talk to me. It's actually really great because I took over a project that was started last year by a student named Skylar Davidson. So this is actually the second year this project has run. And um, we were able to work with an organization called I Support the Girls, which is actually both a national and international organization that was started a while ago. And it helps girls not only get sanitary products, but bras as well. And I just think it's really important to recognize that, like, even locally here in Longmont, normally we think of these problems as something that's like, you know, like somewhere like far away from us. But like here locally in Longmont, the shelter here has shortages of products that women need desperately. And it gives them the opportunity to have the chance to get to work because, like, if you don't have the products you need, you can't go to work or you can't go to school. And it just causes so many issues no one thinks about. And it's it's really a simple fix. We just got to do it. It is things that are necess- necessary for simple dignity. Yeah. To have some dignity. You cannot be going through those normal female things and not have them and still be expected to show up at work and show up at but typically you do not have someone so young like yourself be aware of that and know that that is really tied to the success of just everyday existence of being a woman. Where does that come from in you? Um, for me personally, it's always been really important to me that I was like, I identify as like a feminist. I think it's really important to think about issues and 
Um, when I was in middle school, we actually did this project with um, kind of our youth group where we created period, period kits for women in Africa. And it kind of just like from there, it was always in the back of my mind. And then as I got into more like activism, I was older, I became like started researching all these issues online, like period poverty came up. And it was like this really big issue that I had like, I hadn't really like thought about or heard about. And I feel like no one really knows it exists except for like a select group of people online. Right. And I just thought it would be good if more people knew. Mm-hmm. No question. Not only raising awareness, but also educating um, as yeah. well. What, if anything, surprised you when you started this project? Was it that people did not know? Was it that people didn't care? Was it that um, the folks that you were trying to help were surprised that you were trying to help them because they don't expect it? Um, share some of that insight. Honestly, I was I was a little surprised about how ready people were to talk about it because I know period is a little bit taboo and there's definitely some of that still. But if I if I bring it up with my friends, they're they're all ready to learn about it, and it's it's really great. It's actually a little inspiring that people are so much more ready to talk about this and to help out. Like, even I have guy friends who offered like, you know, I can I can drive you to get stuff, I can buy stuff to donate. It's been really great. Oh, that is outstanding. Keep those friends. Those are good friends. Yeah, that's important because to your point, when you say taboo, you're absolutely right. It's like, but this is an everyday function of life. Mm -hmm. This isn't anything that's, you know, we should shy away from, especially when you're mature enough to talk about it and talk about it in a way that can be beneficial for those who are in need. Because really what we're talking about is those who are in need not getting what they need from society. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, it is absolutely great. Are you proud of yourself? A little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I know there's a long way to go and I want to I want to get all the way there before I feel accomplished. (laughs) Well. I will be proud for you because to even start the journey takes courage Um, because in many ways, people, whether they mean to or not, just kind of want to dismiss. If we don't think about that problem, it's not a problem. The more we have individuals like yourself who are raising the awareness and saying, no, no, you need to think about this. This is an issue. You should sit up a little straighter and beam a little brighter, honey, because that is a very good thing. The challenges of this year, I'm sure, have made your particular project even more difficult. But in one word, how would you describe the year 2020? Inspiring, honestly. Like, it's it's crazy how much is going wrong, but it's also crazy how much is going right, too. Like, people are finally standing up about issues that have been going on for forever and they're yeah. like they're coming out in like the thousands to like donate and yeah. offer like food and stuff. It's it's really incredible. And it does give you hope. Thank you for what you're doing, Katie Ann or Cat Crawl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Over the last few months. Longwent has faced a time where its colorful culture has fought to stay alive. While some popular businesses bounce back from events of the pandemic, many others have began to close their doors, not able to compete under their circumstances. And like many of the localities of Longwent, musicians have also faced hard times. Closed venues, empty seats, and nobody to perform for. Music has brought Longmont together from local breweries to downtown. As a musician myself, there is a very specific bright type of hope performing live gives to the community. Now is the time to bring it to our Longmont community. We are the project to move music through our community. We are Music in the Mob. Adrian Debutant, Music in the Mont. I have been wanting to say that ever since I got the list of all these projects. (laughs) I think it is the coolest name. Let me just tell you. Thank you you so much. Oh, goodness. It was a fun name to come up with. (laughs) You know, I'm sure. Trust me, this was made up just for you. Just for you. No question. (laughs) So talk a little bit about your musical instrument, your love for music, and how you tie that into your project. 
All right, musical instrument. Um, lots, very much lots. So I, I started with the violin a while ago. So that was sixth grade where I started with that, and that's where I first got that initial love of music. It was sixth grade orchestra. I picked up the violin. I was playing it, and I was just in love the moment I picked it up. And then I went throughout middle school. I started to get through some honors orchestra experiences and many other things that were attributed to music, and a lot of that sort of um sense of being able to keep that music musical heart going and then later on i picked up the guitar the mandolin and maybe the ukulele or banjo and bass on a good day some days i'm feeling them more than others but um i have a lot of love for it and i guess it all started you taught yourself how to play the guitar a little bit myself, but then also there was a guitar class. And then right after that guitar class, I just kept teaching myself. I kept trying to get through it. And eventually I learned how to play it. So it was a really, really sort of awakening moment that I was able to sort of teach these instruments to myself and learn all these different kinds of languages of music that I haven't learned before. Well, now you're making me feel bad because I got a guitar for Christmas, oh, I don't know, five, six years ago. and. Let's just say I just recently learned. (laughs) (laughs) If you ever in business to teach people, I'm raising my hand. Here I am. But. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Getting back to you. So you're working with local musicians and local businesses to raise funds. Where did that passion, that need to help? You know, it's one thing to say, I love instruments and I want to play, but it's something else to say, you know, I want to play with a purpose. Yeah, that purpose really arose out of the sort of um, things that I just saw news, saw just kind of everywhere during when all this first hit, because be it, no one was prepared for it. And much less very small businesses run by just a couple of people or just not really able to compete against big box things or compete with Amazon or Walmart. So when I was starting to see these things that I enjoyed since, and that either just comes from my love of just to go around town and go to these different cities, sort of my interest for business and a few other things, I was just kind of saying that um, that paired with that there are many musicians not being able to really sort of go out into the community and do these things that they would normally do Mm because fiddle group i've been a part of them for four years now um um, that's that's something that i've always loved to do and what they've done is that every year they've gone out into the community they love playing the community usually loves to hear us and i see one the joy it brings and then two the sort of attraction to business that it brings. So I just put one and one together and then I just saw Music in the Mont as a great project to not only revitalize music, but to also revitalize local business and sort of give back to things in the community that have given so much to it. This project being very important to you and also really to members of the community, whether they know it or not, but it also can speak to what your next is Going into music or being a musician, is that where you were going in your life experience, you think? I'm going into um, engineering and business. But the thing is of going into music, what I found for music is that no matter what position you're in, no matter if you're highly academic, doesn't matter if you're a visual artist or if you're in all these kind of large, diverse and completely sometimes unrelated fields Mm -hmm. that music even just isn't as a major itself, but just as sort of this being of being able to bring tons of people from different places, from different backgrounds, from different instruments all together in the one same place that it's about sort of carrying the tune in a sense and where you're able to still enjoy music. You're able to love it. You're able to still feel it and perform for your community. And it's not just in the prestige of being a great virtuoso musician, but in being the musician that in your community brings a smile on the faces of a couple of kids playing in the playground in front of your little setup that you have with your friends. You know what? You are special. No question about it. You are very, very special. In one word, last question, describe the year 2020 using one word. 
To use one word, I would say opportunity. And the reason I say opportunity is that despite all of these things, despite all of the economic, despite all of the um, lively social and everything else that has been happening during these times, all of it isn't just the obstacle, but there's also the way and to find ways to make things better in a way to look at things that we've never been able to see them before. And to now know we have the power and we have the opportunity to solve and to sort of better our lives by solving these problems. You give me hope, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Makes a huge difference. Thank you. Good job. Very good job. Welcome back to Grow Through It, where mindsets blossom. I'm your host, Peter Frito. It seems as though one of the biggest challenges that our generation faces is a lack of the right mindset, and I'm here to change that. With the help from Ben Cobb of Brainwaves, I'm making my own podcast to help give a little insight on growth mindset from a teenager. Learning about growth mindset in school has impacted the way I think now, and I want to be able to give my community the same growth mindset teaching that I learned. With help from some distinguished guests and growth mindset wizards, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Next, I am uh, really thrilled to talk to Mr. Peter Frito. And I really got a big kick out of reading about your project, even seeing some of the work that you've done, grow through it. Talk about the origin of where that came from, Peter. So it kind of started in um, about 11th grade when we read the book Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck. And I've never, before that, I never really kind of knew what mindset or growth mindset was. But after reading that book, I kind of had like, an insight on it because I thought that, wow, this is really meaningful. And I think that a lot of people should learn how to do it. And then throughout 11th grade, I kind of was seeing different kind of mindset tendencies with teachers and students. And I thought that this would be something that I think my peers and other people in the community should know about. What did it do to unlock your mindset? Um, I think it just gave me the qualities and the capabilities to learn about mindset and then kind of realize what it is in me and how it should, how it benefits me, kind of unlocking different skills. So when you hear the word mindset, what do you think of? When I hear mindset, I think of yet. One of my teachers has a thing in there, room that says the power of yet. And it's basically saying that you may be kind of not in a good place, but you can move on. It's like yet saying you're not done yet. And it's not giving up and persevering. All right, yeah, that is a life journey and a life lesson. No question. Yeah. And so now, how did you tie that into podcast interviewing? Talk about how that really kind of plays out in your project. So I was kind of thinking about how to make it COVID friendly because it was about that time where we were thinking about that. And then I remembered I was at Public Education Day in March of last year and I met Ben Kalb of the podcast Brainwaves, who happens to be my mentor also. Oh. And I just contacted him because I thought that that might be something interesting to do because I wanted a way to spread the word about mindset and I thought a podcast might be the best idea. Yeah, no, I, I especially in this time of COVID and speaking of the pandemic and just where we are, what do you think about when you think, okay, we're in this pandemic and you talk to so many different people, do you see an, do you feel like we have an enlightened mindset or do you feel like we're kind of stuck in the mud mindset collectively? I think, kind of negatively we I think that some of us are in the stuck in the mud mindset I think that as I kind of noticed that on the news like COVID fatigue I think that people are kind of getting tired of wearing masks and staying in but I think the one big thing people have to realize is like the end goal of what we'd like to get out of it sure. like as they're always saying over the news like um yes it, it's hard right now to just stay indoors and not see anyone but if you want to be able to as they said like see your family for Christmas or Thanksgiving then this is the stuff we got to do now that's absolutely right. And so that growth mindset that you're talking about having people really tap into, because most people, would you agree, are not in a growth mindset. They're kind of they're kind of either just complacent where they are or comfortable or maybe perhaps needing to be enlightened and not knowing where to go to get that. I think it's the, the latter part. It's they everyone has a growth mindset. It's just a matter of being able to tap into it yourself and realize the skills and the goals that you need to get through your problems. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, absolutely those problems collectively, I think individually as well as collectively as a society. Last question, Peter, if you had to sum up the year 2020 in one word, what would it be? Ooh, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I'd say challenging. Because mm-hmm. I think that even though it's hard for everyone to do different things, it's not, It's I, I'd say it's not terrible because different people have gotten out different things that they'd like. Right. So it's not, I think it's not like super bad or anything, but I think it's just a challenge that everyone's been going through. So. Has it made you be more determined in having a made up mind? Like, don't tell me I can't do something. Just move and watch me do it. I think it has. Mm-hmm. Because over over the summer, I also started running more too, which is something that I hadn't done a lot. And I think that having COVID and everything and kind of being bored all the time kind of pushes me to do more and try to get more out of it. So, yeah. Good for you. Well, kudos on the project. And I wish you well in this podcast interviewing. I love this mindset. I do read and I had never read Carol Dweck's book. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you. Hello, Allegra. Hello. Good. It's good to talk to you. I love the kids' night out to go. That is such a catchy name. It is so unusual and different. And yet it really speaks to really the essence of what you are doing. How did you think of that? Well, kids' night out. Well, originally I wanted to carry kids' night out on the like like a regular kids night out in the past, which is on Saturday night. But then like due to the COVID-19 and the pandemic, and I don't think we're going to do it. So for the safety of the children, I decided to do like create bags of to-go bags to hand over to the kids. And then like in- inside it include, um, the essential or like the main part of Kiss Night Out, which is craft and activity or game and then snacks and all of our information of the leaflet, which is why I'm supporting. Oh, that's wonderful. And so supporting this orphanage in Ghana is that mm-hmm. part of, I mean, most people said, OK, we're going to take this money and we're going to use it to support, you know, something locally. And I think it is great that you're doing Ghana. How did you make that connection? Well, originally I would like, I want to support something that like connects with me that like I can relate. Yeah. And I was talking to Miss Adam about it, about who and what. And then she suggested the leaflet to me and I heard about them and I was like, this is such a great idea oh. because I was in North, I was in Northern. So I kind of like, I feel like it's my like right and responsibility to help and look after the other orphans who are going through hard times. Oh, that is wonderful and so inspiring during these times where people, you know, we're not helping enough. Is that where your inspiration came from? Share a little bit about your background and how this original idea was born. Oh, so, well, I was in Northern China and education was like not really for everyone, especially for orphans. And like my orphanage is, 
is for the people who have disability in some sort. Like for me, it was cleft palate. So, and in my other alternate, we have uh, many of them have different types of that, and not many of us were sent to school. Mm-hmm. And I just felt that like it's such a like a pity for them, and like just so sad, like how they they had the opportunity to like study and like being able to like being able to grow and like have a future actually like but so that's where our, my idea came from that's exactly right and so giving somebody else that chance the same as you is beautiful i think you're gorgeous because so many times we don't get to see the flower blossom right we just get to hear about it this project uh, whether you recognize it or not is allowing you to blossom to show not only this is where I've come from, but this is how I can make a difference in the lives of people who otherwise may not have gotten that chance. Is this a field that you want to work in once you graduate? Um, I'm not. I'm still not sure like what field, but I do want to like if I don't shoot the that field to help them, I would still help them in like on my like a. Uh, aside from job thing, like a hobby, like continue like volunteering and funding the kids. And like, I think that's my future plan. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. Because there's been so much craziness. I mean, you got the pandemic, just all of that. How would you describe the year 2020? <laughs> the year 2020? Um, let's say it's very different and uh, like strange. That's in you, like yeah. I like it's that. Kind of hard to, yeah. <laughs> strange. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I want to commend you on a job that has been so good and what you are doing to help other people and brighten their day. And otherwise, they wouldn't have that. That means a lot. It may seem like it's really simple. And it's nothing, but in these times, it's the little things that go so far. So thank you so much, Allegra. Yeah, of course. Welcome back to Cooking with the Raptors. I am Jasmine Giles. Today, we are making toast. First, put the bread in the toaster and decide on the setting of how toasted the bread you want. After you're done toasting the bread, it should look like this. The last step is to put on the spread for your toast. Some examples could be butter, chocolate, honey. That is how you make toast. Through the project Cooking with the Raptors, I want to help kids at home while parents are busy to have simple recipes that they can cook themselves. Thank you for watching Cooking with the Raptors. See you next time. Welcome, Jasmine. This is the class of 2021. Unbelievable. How are you feeling today? (laughs) I'm feeling good. Your project, um, it was so interesting and so moving because Talk where that inspiration came from. And I know that you spent some early years in the Chinese orphanage, but talk to me about what this all meant to you and why you chose what you chose. Yeah. Um, So in the beginning, my project was going to be a hand-me-down project, sensory safety. And it was going to help other kids um, with sensory disorders orders and help them. But then as COVID started, I couldn't do that anymore because we all are online. So I thought of what I did in China in the orphanage. So my experience in China was um, the orphanage was nice and we were able to live and have what we need, but we didn't have extra and especially on food since with a lot of people there. 
So my experience that I thought of was one day there was a stray dog that was dead at our front door of our orphanage and our caretakers took it and cooked it. And I think that was the first time looking back at it where I experienced food related issues. Yeah. How realized how poor our orphanage was. Right. So that's my train of thought as I thought about what I could do right now through COVID to help kids who are at home yeah. to get food. You know, sometimes I'm sure that you look at kids who've been born in this country and don't really know what it's like to have a real hardship um, and say, y'all don't even know Y'all don't even know the challenges that when you start talking about food scarcity and whatnot, your project was so, uh, for lack of a better word, grown up, right? Phrase, grown up. It was so moving because of what you have been through. During this time of COVID, what would you say to the average American student, somebody who has been born here versus somebody who migrated here and is now American? Talk about that. I would say um, be happy for what you have because you never know what things will happen in your life, but be happy for what you have right now. Um, you have electronics, you have blankets, you have shelters to go to. And that is something that I didn't have. I was, I went to the orphanage at four. Um, I was lost at a furniture store and the police didn't mm. look for my parents that long and so they sent me to the orphanage at that age mm. and from four to eight was where i lived and a lot of people then um we had a lot of donations to for our orphanage so i would definitely say to americans now be happy for what you have a warm home family, food. Jasmine, you have really put um, a really big exclamation point on, in many ways, this period in our history. So many times we can't see for looking, as my mother used to say, look at what you have and be thankful for that, not at what you don't have. Final words, what would you say to sum up this year, senior year for you? In one word, what would you use? Chaotic. <laughs> well said. Well said, young lady. Thank you so very much. You were great. Thank you. My name is Jackson Helwig, and for my capstone project, I am working with Invelo Safari Lodges. My goal here is to raise as much awareness as possible and hopefully that can bring in some funding. There are a lot of different areas I could focus on, but after talking to a few staff members at Invelo, I have narrowed it down to the Cobras, who are an anti-poaching team, and the overpopulation of elephants, which is causing a chain reaction of problems. The biggest reason why I have chosen Invelo comes from my background with travel. Ever since I was a baby, my mom, who is a travel agent, has brought me all around the world and given me the chance to experience things I never knew before. Thank you for supporting Invelo. So I looked at some of the things that all of the students were doing. And while they are all unique and so very different, yours was the most. Um, you're working with the Invelo Safari in Zimbabwe. How did you give birth to all of that? So I got to say, this comes from more of a personal connection with my family. Um, okay. My mom is a travel agent, so she's been all around the world for many years. And um, she has a good friend, Butch, who is a big part of Invelo. So my mom, he came out to the U.S. My mom and him were talking and she's like, hey, can you just send my son off for a couple weeks? And he was like, yeah, totally. So I plan to have a more or less of a volunteer internship kind of thing. Um, for six weeks in Zimbabwe at the end of my junior year, awesome. but due to COVID that didn't happen. Right. 
So hopefully my plan was to just go down there, do what they need me to do and hopefully bring back a project to work on for this capstone. But now I kind of have to just do that in reverse. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. find the capstone, do the capstone, and then hopefully I'll be able to go back down there. Absolutely. So it would be um, remiss if I did not tell you, I am the individual in our family, besides being a wife. Um, I love to see the animals in the wild. Now, I will also tell you, um, the closest I've been to anything like a safari was going through what they call the Serengeti in Munich, Germany. <laughs> And so how did you get involved besides your mom? Because if your mom had said, I want you to take my son on and you hated animals and you didn't want to, you wouldn't have been so gung ho. So where does it come from in you? Um, it definitely comes from, again, my mom showing me and giving me these, these experiences. But when I was um, 10 years old, we did go to South Africa and I got to experience the safari. Yeah. Along with other countries and just animals, we also live on a farm, so I'm around horses, chickens, dogs, cats. <laughs> the love for animals is always there. Yeah, yeah. And if I can just tie that in with working with outside organizations, kind of in the way my mom does, just bringing cultures together, that is something that really appeals to me and something I would love to do later in life. Do you find that bringing cultures together is really a metaphor for the times we live in? I think we have so much more in common in trying to do so many things, but the barriers of language and space and location, time, all those things serve as a, not just a barrier, but it, a hindrance. Do you think if we could do away with a lot of that, we would certainly be able to get along more than we currently do? I do agree with that. I, I definitely agree that I mean, there's a lot of reason why people don't travel. I mean, first of all, if you're going to go somewhere, you need to learn the language or at least have an idea of the language right. and, you know, different foods. And there's a whole bunch of there's just a whole bunch of different things that it's different. Right. But right. then again, that's also part of traveling right. is experiencing that difference and learning that language and trying that different food. That is very unique. Um, so many people you will find as you continue to grow and move on, you will find have not left this country, right? And you think the importance of leaving this country as it relates to your project, Jackson, share a little bit about just having that perspective of having lived outside of this country or being outside of this country or even wanting to. Some people don't even see the value in leaving. What do you say to those individuals? I'm, I'd say that they're missing out, that there's, there's a lot great with our country. And if you're more than happy to stay here, I say you should stay here, make this your home, but you also should see other places and experience what other people's homes are like. Cause I mean, there's a lot of people on the other side of the world in other continents that haven't traveled to the U S yeah. they haven't been here. So they're also in the same position where they think that where they are is amazing and they don't want to, they don't want to try anything new. Yeah. So yeah. I think if you just can get past that and go experience something, whether you hate it or you love it, then, then you know. When you found out because of COVID that you could not go and yet you still said, you know, cause you could have changed your mind, but you said, you know what? I still want to do this. Where does that come from? Why did you still want to do it? Why was the passion still there? I feel that just, just because I can't physically go there and I can't get a start on the project and blah, blah, blah during the summer, I feel that I could still actually make a difference as I would if I went there. Like yeah. I can still do something positive for this company, yeah. even though I'm not physically there. And that's, I mean, that's what a lot of people are trying to do, especially with COVID now. So mm -hmm. I might as well try to do the same. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I agree. If you had to sum up 2020 in one word, Jackson, what would you say? What's the word? Ooh, this is tough. Um, 
experience. Mm. I'll say that for sure. Mm. And use that in as why the word experience. That's unique. No one has ever used that word. And I've asked every one of the classmates, and there are quite a few in front of you. Why experience? Well, this is something that none of us as humans have lived for, lived through before. So we're all experiencing this for the first time. And depending on where we are in the world and even in our own country, things are just different for everybody. Yeah. So I think that all of this is going to come down to when it eventually ends is just experience and knowing what has happened and what you can take out of it and learn and better yourself for it. Extremely insightful. That's very insightful, Jackson. Thank you. And thank you for being on the front lines of, of even helping this as I see these majestic animals because they are so immense. Um, I just, I just, I marvel because they are gentle giants in many ways. They are. You know, so thank you for what you're doing. Of course. Thank you. You are very welcome. Good job. Hey, do you hear the announcements when you're in school? No, I don't. I've only heard like one announcement since we've been back. Yeah, I don't even know what's going on anymore because I don't even go. You know if you're going to the football game on Friday? Mm, I'm not sure. Are you going to the viral club meeting after school? We had a viral club? I'm Carson Hills and I run Raptor Report. And if you're tired of not knowing what's going on around Silver Creek High School, then Raptor Report is what you need. I help to leave behind an establishment that is full of students who know what is happening around them, where they can be proud of their school. Announcements can be tough to hear sometimes, and with online school being implemented, it is hard to get everyone their information. Raptor Report is a new source about everything going on around the school, including clubs, sports, and other important announcements. Raptor Report is what keeps you up to date on everything Silver Creek. Carson Hills is the next individual I'm going to interview for the SCLA 2020. And Carson, Raptor Report, talk a little bit about that and where the origin of the Raptor Report comes from. Uh, Raptor Report was created two years ago by actually my older sister, Kira Hills. Mm -hmm. And she created it to um, make videos for students that just inform them about what is going on around the school. Mm -hmm. Because well, when I was a sophomore, when she created it, she came to me with the idea and it was just really good because when she was filming them, I was in there with her, helping her out. And she would be saying all these things that I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And I would talk to my friends about it and they would have no idea what was going on. Yeah. So it's just really good to inform the students. Now, it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of times either one, students will think they're informed and two, they'll think, you know what, we're young students. It can't be that important. We don't want to know. What have you found out to be such a, I was going to say fallacy, but what have you found out as it relates to the Raptor Report as to why students are now, oh my gosh, was that in the Raptor Report? Or we need to put that in the Raptor Report because it's important. Yeah, well, there's like so many different places you can find they have every different thing for the school. Yeah. Like they have an Instagram for the yearbook. They have a website for the football. They have all these different places. And so it's just hard to be able to keep track of every single different place that you need to find your information. So mm -hmm. to have the one video for Raptor Report was just really helpful to be able to know where everything is. What is the strangest story that was contained in the Raptor Report this year? This year was probably probably Maddie Kewell uh, winning uh, the Player of the Year and the Pitch of the Year for softball. That was just amazing to me because <laughs> she really was outstanding this year. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm sure it was because how many and I guess how do you go about determining? Um, is it how many clicks you get on it? How many people read it? How do you track that information for the Raptor Report? Uh, well, YouTube tells me how many people watch it, obviously. Right. But also, uh, when I'm just like walking around school, I'll like ask some people, I'll be like, hey, did you know this was going on? And if they're like, yes, even if they don't say it's from Raptor Report, I'm just like happy they know because that's that's the goal. 
<laughs> Absolutely. No, that, that would be the goal. No question. And so this is your passion. Now, do I feel like you are going to be a journalist? Because I'm thinking yes, but you like writing, you like being in this realm. What's next for you as it relates to the Raptor Report or R squared as some people like to call it? Yeah, that's the main reason I took it on actually is because I wanted to pursue like a career in journalism and broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to major in in college. And this was just the perfect sort of project to fit that. Why are you inspired so much to be a journalist? Well, the main reason is when I was a kid, I would watch all of these different sports games, basketball, football, mm -hmm. and and I would read about it in the in the newspaper and the announcers and the writers would just like mm -hmm. make me so excited to watch the games that I wanted to be able to do that myself. So you want to go into sports? Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. No, it's 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 all wonderful and and very <laughs> They definitely need um, good journalists. Now, last question. If you had to describe the year 2020 in one word, what word would you pick? Mm, unstable. Mm. That's a good word. Thank you. That is a good way to put it, too. It's like, ooh, we were all shaky. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Well, I thank you, Carson. You have done a wonderful job, and I love the Rapid Report, and I'm glad you guys started it and you continued it on. Let's hope somebody will continue it once you're gone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you for having me. You are very welcome. Good job. Hello, my name is Ellie Huff. I'm a 17-year-old skier out of Boulder, Colorado. I came up with this dream to create a film that would encourage young girls to find confidence in themselves through experience, and in this case, skiing. We want this film to spread our love and passion as well as the lessons we've learned from skiing to younger girls. So you are a lady that I have really been wanting to talk to. I'm talking about Miss Ellie Huff. Hello there, Ellie. Hi, how's it going? It is going really good. And you, how's it going for you? Pretty well. I'm really excited to talk about my project today. I am excited to hear about your project. So Ripping Lady Ski Film, talk a little bit about that. And let me just think, do you ski? That would be absolutely yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I've been a big skier. I've been a big skier since I was two years old, I think that's when I got on skis. Wow. But um, one of the main reasons I wanted to do a ski film is kind of different than any other project. Um, I wanted to make something that's more than just videos. So this film kind of is made to encourage young girls to find confidence in themselves um, through experience. And what we decided to do with the whole group I have filmed this is do it through a ski film. Um, so we're gonna find different ways and different stories and put them all together through a film. That is absolutely wonderful. Now, when you start talking about extreme sports, what do you mean? I know what you mean, but I know there are others who are like, well, what does that mean? It's more than just skiing. Yeah, so um, extreme sports, sports that women are not usually in, um, there's a huge difference the ratio, I believe, between men and women in extreme sports is usually three to one or four to one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's huge differences um, in numbers compared to other sports because they're new. And um, basically, we're just trying to grow the numbers in the sports. Absolutely. Especially you, um, I hear you have mad skills. What does that mean? 
Um, well, <laughs> I guess I can ride the sticks pretty well, the skis pretty well. Um, I've been competing, I think, since eighth grade. And not only has skiing made me become a really good athlete, it's kind of given me an identity, kind of personality. Um, and I just want little girls to feel the way I did through skiing. You know, it made me feel confident in myself. And I just, if I can give that to other girls, it's kind of greater than anything I can do with my own ski career. That spills over into other areas of your life, you're saying, your confidence. Yes. Yeah. And you don't definitely. see that a lot in girls, younger girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in sports. Um, I think skiing gave me a community and that sense of self. Um, and that's just bigger than skiing itself. So I think when people like see ski film, I want it to be more than the ski film. I really want it to be cool. And so when you say ripping ladies, why ripping ladies? Um, so I actually didn't come up with that name. Um, it was a program started through the competition center that I'm a part of, and they created this program. And they had a bunch of us older ladies come in. And they were like, okay, guys, um, people are dropping, or little girls are dropping out of sports rapidly. They're dropping um, out of all sports, not just our sport in general. Do you guys have any way to encourage girls to stay in the sport. And so during quarantine, um, a few of us had this idea, why don't we just make a film to try to inspire the little girls? So that's where the Ribbon Ladies name stuck. And then we came up with the name Novia for the actual film, which means girlfriend in Spanish, because it's kind of the girl. Oh, Novia. No, that is absolutely wonderful. I'm a part of a group called the Mujeres, which is woman in Spanish. And so it's funny that you bring that up. Has your film been seen by, say, like the Girl Scouts? I know they've started a huge advocacy program to get young girls um, or girls, period, engaged, not just in politics, but to advocate for themselves and government and civics, all of these things and in sports. And so it immediately yeah. begs the question, now we need to get this in front of those girls who it can inspire. Yeah. So um, actually, we're working with a group that's similar to the Girl Scouts, but for skiing, they're called Jumps. And they're trying to encourage um, everyone of every background to the sport, um, no matter what ability, no matter where you're from. Um, so we're really working with them to address biases as well in our ski community, which has been really cool to hear. Um, and it's going to be a huge part of our script. But... Yeah, they're similar to the Girl Scouts. And kind of to market our film to little girls, we're going to enter it in the upcoming year into a bunch of e-film competitions. Good. I was going to say, I hope so. That is yeah. Um And like, yeah. go ahead. no, I think it's great. I think that is absolutely wonderful and very necessary at a time such as these. I just think all the positive images um, of young girls, women, women who are going to be, or ladies who are going to be later on. I mean, every single stage, you can never get enough of seeing something that is positive as it relates to women. If you had to describe this year in one word, and you can't use chaotic, because um, they tried to beat it to death earlier, and I'm like, pick another word. <laughs> pick another. Give me the one word that you would use to describe the year 2020. Um. I was going to say hectic, but that's pretty close to chaotic. Um, I have to say kind of spontaneous because we had to spontaneously do things throughout this whole year that we never thought we'd have to go through. Did you have to improvise a lot? Um, yes, especially for this project. Um, even now, we're facing some challenges with everything possibly going back into shutdown. So it's just... You have to be really patient with these kind of things. And I think it's really taught me how to be patient, especially with product. Well, I love the product um, of, uh, or the name of your project because it's intentional. You intentionally are going to show young girls that if I can do this, you can do this. And quite frankly, it's not just young girls. I'll be so bold as to say it inspires older women and women who would be in their 60s and 70s and even 80s because if you are alive, I always say it's never too late. So kudos yeah. to you for doing it. Thank you so much. You are so very welcome. Good job.
Blackhawk 739, Yankee Mike, departing runway 26, charter flight number 3, pilot to pause rescue. So my next interviewee is Alicia King. So the name of her project is SCLA Supports Pilots in Pause, or I would just like to say Pilots in Pause. I love the P and the P. I think it is so very great. Raising funds and awareness to really talk about rescuing rescue animals. Did I get that right? Yes. And so we hear so many times whether it is an animal that is in you know, just everyday animals. By that, I mean the dogs and cats that we consider our family members and, you know, horses that are in places. But all of that coupled with now, we're looking at rescuing those who would rescue or serve as rescue animals or serving as. Where did you come up with that? Um. Well, I would say it just kind of combines two of my passions in a really fun and creative way um i really like the idea of becoming a pilot and flying and all that and so through this organization i'm um actually learning to get my pilot's license by participating in this organization Mm, and then on top of that yeah and on top of that um i just really love dogs and animals it's i just have a like a special place in my heart for them and um yeah i just wanted to do something cool with those two things no, that, that means a great deal. Now, how much of an impact have you had during this year where you've got COVID and just, you know, all of these challenges that we faced? Because I'm sure it was difficult. How did you handle that? Um, well, it's been interesting, but I would say the biggest component has been um, finding new ways to fundraise and um, finding creative ways to really raise awareness about this um, amazing organization. Um, Cause you know, you can't really do those traditional fundraising ideas that right. we typically see. So to keep things safe and um, productive, I guess I've had to come up with some new and interesting <laughs> ideas for fundraising and we'll see how they go this year. No, I bet you have. And what has been the biggest challenge as it relates to um, raising awareness about this issue? Um, I feel like in this particular situation, there's a very specific target audience that um, appears to be designated to this project or organization. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, I would really love to just raise awareness to any audience that will listen. I think that's going to be um, one of my personal goals anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to raise that awareness. And and you're right. I mean, I think while people absolutely, um, you know, most people have a love for dogs, it really does um, take you into a different realm when you're saying, hey, we need to rescue these rescue animals and make sure that they, too, are taken care of. There is so much, um, you know, that really we need our, our awareness raised about. But I do believe you becoming a pilot as a result of this is like, wow. Thank you. (laughs) So talk a little bit about that as it relates to becoming a pilot to do this job. It's usually, I like this, and I'm going to let somebody else fly the plane. But you said, you know, what the heck with waiting on somebody? I'm going to become a pilot too. Yes. So actually, my dad is a uh, private pilot. And um, he's been a pilot for 20 plus years. And it's actually one of the coolest qualities. I admire it so much. I think um, it's just so cool. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So I and he's one of my biggest role models. So as I look up to him and kind of see what he's been able to experience by actually participating in Pilots and Paws, Mm -hmm. I've come to find that I really kind of want to do the same thing. Participating in Pilots and Paws has given me the opportunity to get hours because you need hours just 
licenses, it's like you're getting your driver's license. Right. So I've been able to do that some. Um, and I think it's just a really cool quality to have and a really cool skill. And I've learned so much from it already. So, yeah. I bet. I bet. If you had to describe the year 2020 in one word, what would it be? Ooh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> um, maybe adventurous. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Only you, Alicia, would say adventurous. That is good. You are my first adventurous all afternoon, and this is why you are the perfect person for this program. Thank you so much for all you're doing and will do. Thank you so much. You're very, good. very, very welcome and very good job. Did you know that only 50% of young people voted in the 2020 election? My name is Nehemiah King, and it's numbers like this that help motivate me to start my capstone project, Developing Democracy, which promotes youth political engagement in Longmont, Colorado. It has never been more important for young people to share their voices in politics. Like many Americans, I feel a disconnect between my life experiences and goals and the political leaders of our country. By engaging with politics, young people will be able to take the step in closer aligning the government with the people. COVID-19 has forced flexibility on my project. Currently, I am running social media accounts that spread political info, and I will soon start live streaming political events in order to make them more understandable for young people. The future may also hold an internship with local government. The election may have passed, but politics never end. And as the backbone of our society, it is imperative that everyone gets involved. This starts with our generation. So developing democracy is born. Next up in this wonderful thing we call leadership and the Leadership Academy at Silver Creek High is Nehemiah King, and she has some phenomenal insights, I think, really. I want you to talk a little bit about the name of your project, because I know Developing Democracy, but what does that mean really, Nehemiah? Um, so basically, the name of my project came because I'm targeting young people in my local community, so kind of trying to develop that from the ground up from, like, when you're in high school and middle school, and then being able to continue that in your future. Do you think people who are in high school and middle school um, are either one, not even seen when it comes to politics, or two, taken for granted, or three, not engaged enough in what's happening around them because it certainly impacts them whether they know it or not? Right, yeah, I think all of that's really true. I think the main thing is that when you are young, it's really easy to pretend like, you know, you're kind of outside all these things happening. Like so many political things seem so outside the realm of our possibilities and our lives, but it really does impact us. And you can start involving yourself in politics from like day one, basically. So how did you get interested in politics and how did you give birth to this particular idea? Yeah, I've always kind of been interested in politics. My family's always been pretty politically involved, like my grandparents. My grandpa's a lawyer, so I've always kind of grown up with that, and I kind of want to go into that in my future. But I know that that is not like a general reflection of the public. Like so many people do not have that strong standing when it comes to politics, yes. and so I just wanted to spread that. And when you say spread, as you see developing democracy, is that a little D or a big D? What What's the end game, and where do you plan traveling to make this happen? Because you alluded to travel. Yeah, so it's just kind of um, creating people's like awareness of politics. Um, so just starting kind of on like the small scale, like I've been doing some stuff with voter registration, which is just like kind of that first little step that can expand into so many things right. and getting people aware that these political events are even happening because sometimes people aren't. Right, absolutely. When you talk about voter registration, being involved at the level that you were involved, what were your takeaways from your experience? Um, I think I realized that it's really important for young people to get involved because I was doing some research and the numbers, like the turnout, is so low for people in my demographic. And so it's just really crazy to think about how much our voting pattern could change or just what impact it would be if young people were more involved. Right. And so when you start talking about them being involved, do you, uh, in, in, in this particular political season, I guess... There was so, I've never seen it. I mean, I've been on the planet a few years um, <laughs> and I have never seen it so polarizing 
And I wondered from your eyes in your age group, what did you see? Um, I think this year I saw way more people getting involved than I ever had before, which is really good. But um, and then just kind of I think the main point from that is going to be to capitalize on it because young people have always kind of been involved more with like protesting and stuff. But then there's some more like, I don't know, a little more kind of basic, less fun things, less exciting that also need to be capitalized on in order to kind of expand that. And then I think also a big part of the polarization, just like some general education about politics, about our democratic system could be really impactful because mm. it could help narrow that divide and kind of create some understanding. Right, and that understanding, there is um, a lot that can be said about that. When you look at just the information that we receive, um, regardless of where you get it from online, or you get it from TV, or you get it from just a myriad of places because it's coming at us all times of the day and night, how did you digest that? And do you think that is a good thing or a not so good thing? Um, well, I think having access to political resources is really important. But I think being able to interpret those properly is what needs some developing because all these resources we're getting are tainted with like a political bias. And that's just the reality of politics. But you kind of need to learn how to think critically about all those things to make your own personal political decisions. And you don't think that there is enough critical thinking in our citizenry right now? No, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like political office may be in your future, young lady. What are you thinking, Nehemiah? Yeah, something. I'd love to get involved with like international affairs or something like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I will I will share this or actually let me ask you, your name is so unique. Typically, you <laughs> see the name Nehemiah associated with young males or males, I should mm -hmm. say, as opposed to women. And I wonder, or young females, and I wondered what the origin or what the thinking was behind that from your parents. Yeah, so my parents are kind of trying to do something with like this reversal of gender role sort of because it is more of like a male name and um, Nehemiah is like an architect in the Bible too. Um, so they wanted me to have like a strong more male name and then they named my brother after a love poet to kind of you know, put some more of those like feminine lovey sort of things. Oh, that is yeah. beautiful. Your parents yeah. are extremely insightful. No, Nehemiah is your <laughs> name. And well, thank you. Um, there's no question that that particular piece makes you stand out already. Absolutely. <laughs> and just the way of thinking and what you're doing is extremely refreshing. I want you to be encouraged and continue your journey. Full disclosure, I am the director of public affairs for Mayor Hancock in Denver. That's mm -hmm. my day job. And so when you start talking about international affairs or all the things that are going on that make us us, it is something that has I have never seen anything like what we are experiencing. So I want you to be encouraged. I'm so glad you're interested in moving the ball forward because we need you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You are very, very welcome. Last question. If you had to sum up this year with one word, what would it be? chaotic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had to change everything this year and I've, we're making it work. Everyone is, but it's definitely not been smooth sailing. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you, young lady. Be encouraged. You're wonderful. Thank you. Have a good one. to say that I am working with Together We Rise. Together We Rise is a impeccable organization that helps raise money and other things. Other things this project has to offer are things such as duffel bags with necessities and them like deodorant, toothpaste, and toothbrushes, and shoes, and some things that most foster homes like can't afford for all of their children. So that's like a really big thing. And I was originally planning on doing that, but due to COVID, I cannot take donations in. So I will be doing a square store in order to collect the donations. Some other really great things they have to offer are things like building bags for the children. And this month in December, 
They will be building stockings for the children on Christmas. So I will be spreading that all over my social media page, which is on Facebook. And I will be taking donations from people who are willing to donate. So hopefully we can make enough stockings. I haven't come up with a goal yet, but I am hoping to get enough children, at least enough in one of the foster homes. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you liked my project. Next up, we have Miss Haley Lee. We care for foster care. Together we rise. Talk about why that is important to you and the importance that foster kids get what they need. So many times people don't even realize that that is an issue today. Haley, talk about that. And welcome, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this project is really important to me because when I was six, I was actually adopted and I was going through um, my foster home. I was living with my foster parents and I would go back to my parents and then my biological parents. So I was adopted when I was six. So if I didn't have a good foster home life, then I wouldn't be with my parents now. And I think it's a big deal. Like most foster homes don't have the important necessities that they need. And I think Together We Rise really brings that for them. And I just want to help get them the necessities that they need and make sure that they feel, you know, wanted and not just like they're left behind. So someone what is, cares. Them. What is the biggest challenge? Um, and maybe challenge isn't the right word. What is the biggest misunderstanding that most people have about foster children? I think a lot of people think that foster kids are, you know, like bad kids and like don't care about, you know, their families or themselves and their grades and stuff. But they do care and they want to have a family and they want to have good grades and they want to have a good life. And I think that people just don't understand that because they are forgotten and left behind in the foster homes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just think that's really unreasonable because they're still kids and they still want a future for themselves. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You think in many ways society collectively, I'm not saying that everybody doesn't care, but society collectively have given up on foster kids? Yeah, honestly I do because I think that people will see them and just see them as kids who were given up and kids who weren't good enough to get a family of their own. So I think most people do and most people don't care because they think that their foster homes and their foster parents can care for all of them when most really can't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the fortunate nature that you find yourself in, and I say that only because I recognize that you are mature enough to recognize that you things could have gone differently, but you also value where you are and what you have, and you want to affect change in that realm. The Together We Rise, how did you get people to be aware and to even ask for dollars for the cause? Well, I am making a Facebook page and I am going to advocate for them. And just at the beginning of my video, I put facts. And I think that's really important that people will see like this many kids are being treated poorly or this many kids don't have the things that they need. And I'm hoping people will feel like, see it in the goodness of their hearts to, you know, help the children out. And I think that especially with the holidays coming around, they will. So yeah. that's a good part of that. And certainly being in a pandemic, how do you think being in a pandemic in the year 2020 um, has impacted kids in foster care and just, foster care period well i know for my project i was going to get donations and that's just something i can't do yeah. due to covid because of the pandemic and people won't want to donate and people won't want to risk the kids health and the parents health so i just think that you know like it's hard to get the families the things that they need yeah. and they won't have enough money because their jobs are being stopped. Like they are not getting their paycheck. So I feel like it's the same for everyone, but especially if you have that many kids, it's not gonna be as easy to support for them. Absolutely. Well, I wanna make sure that when you get that link and get everything squared away from Facebook, that you can get my information from Ms. Adams or even send me um, so I can share it on my social media because it is something that requires that everybody 
um, participate in, even if they don't know it yet. I always think about what you do to the least of me and individuals, mm -hmm. you do to us collectively as a society. So somebody helped me, someone has helped you, we should help. Yes, perfect. And I will make sure that I get that to you and I'll communicate. So that would be awesome. Thank you so much. You are so very welcome. In a word, describe the year 2020 for me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think my word would definitely be like tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I have many reasons behind it, and it's it's hard to put into one word, but it's very yeah. difficult. Just tough. But <laughs> tough overall, just because you say that would be your word. Explain what you mean by that, because I think there's more there. There's more you want to say. Yeah. Well. For me, I was, um, I'm always like a more active learner in class. So being online, it's hard for me to focus and it's hard for me to get my work done. And my family and I were going through a move. So it was hard to do online school and move at the same time. So I was just trying my best. Yeah. But there's that. And then there, my, well, my cat died. So that was really oh, sad. That's hard. No, that's tough. Yeah. A lot on your plate. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah. Well, you handled this project beautifully, and I'm glad you're passionate about it. And I understand yeah. now why you're passionate about it, because really, in many ways, you have lived it and overcoming adversity. Best of luck to you. I know you will succeed. Thank you so much. You are very welcome, Haley. Good job. happy, sad, or excited. Dance is freedom. I feel like I can be who I want to be. The next student I have the pleasure of speaking with is Nevin Lockwood, and the name of her project was Online Dance Classes for Kids Called Top Notch Dancer or Steps in Motion, really in essence, is the name of your project. But let me just say this about Steps in Motion. It's hard enough to dance when people are in front of you, right, in person. You're talking about online dance classes. Where did that come from? And aren't you so bold? <laughs> um, well, at first I wanted to do dance classes um, just like for elementary school students um, in the district. I was planning to do it at Indian Peaks. Um, but because of COVID, we decided that it would be better to just do online dance. So that's how I got there. <laughs> wow. Wow. And how long have you been dancing? I've been dancing since I was three years old. <laughs> well, I would say you are definitely the pro. And so when I say dance, what kind of dance? We're talking ballet. We're talking jazz. We're talking the whole genre. A little bit of everything. Um, right now I've done jazz and then I also did a TikTok dance because I know kids are into that right now, but mm -hmm. a little bit of everything. And how has that gone over? I mean, has it been well received or have you had people say, you know, I wouldn't have tried that if it had it not been for you. Talk a little bit about that. Um, for the most part, I've had positive feedback on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know kids have a few kids that I know have watched it and they really liked it. So overall, it's been just positive feedback. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Let me ask you before I ask you uh, another dance question, the origin of your name, specifically Nevin, I love that. How <laughs> much you. does that, I mean, because it says to me that you're very different and unorthodox and somebody who is unique and spectacular. Talk a little bit about how your name plays into how you dance. 
Well, um, my name is actually my great grandpa's middle name. Um, but I think, I don't know, my mom's always like that. And whenever people talk about dance, it's kind of, or in my family, they always think of me. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite genre of dance? Um, I like contemporary and ballet. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Two of the two of the hardest, no question. Ballet. <laughs> and so any aspirations to take what you have turned into a class project on up and further into your life to reach the stage? Uh, because eventually Broadway and all the other big theaters will reopen um, <laughs> and major dance, you know, companies and so forth and so on. But share a little bit about how this plays out in your life, how dance plays out in your life. Um, currently, I am a competitive dancer, um, and I dance at Dance Dimensions, which is where I, like, film everything. And for college, right now, I have tried out for some of the dance teams there um, to do the, like, dancing in the stadiums during football games and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, like, my next step. But also, I would love to be a teacher, like a dance teacher when I'm older. Um, and... That's kind of as far as I thought about that as of now. So what would you want your classmates who are also involved in this project? What do, do you want them to take away from your project or even know about you as it relates to dance? Um, well, dance has been an outlet for me. So it's kind of just somewhere I can go and be with my friends and have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that there is, there can be a little bit of positivity in your life every day and it doesn't have to be something huge mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely if you had to describe this year in one word and you can't use the word chaotic what would it be how would you describe this year in one word um probably growth <laughs> because i feel like there's a lot of different ways that you can like take this like you could be really upset about it or you could just try to focus on like positive things or what you can do instead of what you can't do you are a very optimistic young lady that is good because <laughs> out of all of the negativity there's always some good that comes from it absolutely yeah absolutely thank you so much nevin great job really great job thank you Bikes have always been a part of my life. They've caused so much good and so much bad. <laughs> but through all the crashes, biking has helped me make so many great friends and even better memories. Like on the day we found out prom 2020 was canceled and went riding in suits. I've never been the best rider I know, but I've always been the most passionate. This year, I hope to instill that passion into everyone that touches a bike during my project. I'm Brendan Maroney, and during the fall and winter, I'm throwing virtual bike events such as an upcoming scavenger hunt with hopes that we will be able to do socially distant cruiser rides during the spring. Hello there, Mr. Brendan Maroney. I have looked at your project and I'm like, okay, so you love all things bike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I really like biking. Well, no, this is the perfect state for it, no question. But the name of your project was called Loco Rides. Share a little bit about where that title comes from and why Loco Rides. Well, I really like just like the crazy part of biking. And Loco means crazy in Spanish. And mm -hmm. it also stands for Longmont, Colorado. <laughs> so just kind of two pieces. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. And so why do you like the crazy parts of biking. And what do you mean when you say crazy parts? Well, there's a lot of parts of, of biking that aren't really like traditional, like not what you see on like this, the movie or the, on TV when you're watching the Tour de France. Sure. Like there's a lot of people that just use it as an kind of an outlet to show who they really are, just have fun and like dress up their bikes with lights and ride in costumes around Boulder all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's wow. a big, a big piece of it. No, I'm sure. But it also, I think part of your project dealt with socially distanced um, cruiser bike rides. What? Explain that. 
Yeah, so I think we're just kind of divided in our in our city right now because obviously we have to stay separate. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. while we're going into the like red and orange lockdown levels, we are doing like scavenger hunts around Longmont and just mm -hmm. near Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, so people can go out and ride their bikes and have fun with their families, but not have to be exposed to anyone else. That is actually very good. Very good. And so what's the longest bike ride or mountain bike ride? Because I know the difference between being on flat road or asphalt versus being, you know, in mountainous terrain, a very different ride, no doubt. But um, that's what I thought you meant when you were talking about just the craziness of, of bike rides. But you've been in both realms. That's mm -hmm. your passion. Yeah, I just like basically wherever I can ride a bike is very fun. And I mean, the more challenging, the better, so. Yeah, the longest distance you've ever done on a bike? Uh, I did a hundred miles earlier this summer, which was a long one, but that mountain biking is probably more like five hours. So like 40, 50 miles. Yeah, that's bumpy. I'm assuming you got shock absorbers. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, here's the other piece. What has riding or being with people who are riding bikes, and I understand the social distance and I also understand it being virtual, but has it helped in many ways, even though we have to keep our distance, has it helped bring us together? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I'm a part of a junior cycling team and we've really just grown through the whole COVID thing. Like during the spring, we were doing indoor training workouts on stationary bikes over Zoom. Sure and just a lot of like indoor workouts. And then we finally got to practice together this summer and we're really just growing as a team. And I think if we just implement that on the community, it can really help. Absolutely, absolutely. What would be the one thing you think would surprise people about um, riding bikes or riding a bike? A lot of times people are deterred because they think they can't do it, but even remove the virtualness. If you could bring people together on a bike ride who did not think they could do it, how would you convince them they could do it? I mean, I think I would just say that it's one of the greatest things. Like it's so relaxing and you kind of, your mind just kind of escapes. Like a lot of people, a lot of pro cyclists call it the flow state. You kind of just lose track of time and just forget mm -hmm. what you're doing and only focus on the road ahead. Mm. Sounds like a beautiful escape, no doubt. Mm -hmm. No doubt at all. Well, let me ask you, since you know about bringing together and really encouraging people, what would be the one word you would use to describe the year 2020? Um, I think I would just call 2020 a challenge. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, obviously you're going to overcome a challenge, but when you're faced with it, like during the challenge, it, it seems like it's insurmountable. Yeah. And it really is just difficult, but we'll grow through it. Do you want to take the skills that you have as it relates to writing and become a professional? What's your next? Uh, I don't really think I want to become professional just because I think I would get too tired of bikes. I would get burnt out. Mm -hmm. I think I just want to continue riding for the rest of my life and use it as a way to have fun. Excellent. Brendan, thank you. Great job. Thank you. You are very welcome. The concept of fight, flight, or freeze is when in danger or facing threat, your body's automatic response is to either fight, flight, or freeze. For the longest time, my response to climate change has been to freeze. All of the news stories and reports about the imminent doom we are facing were paralyzing and ultimately, I felt as if I had no future to plan for. This all changed when I began to take part in climate strikes. It was eye-opening to see other youth my age who were not paralyzed or frozen by fear of the climate crisis, but instead, they were taking that fear and they were channeling it into action. As an intern with 350 Colorado, I'm expanding my experience in organizing and gaining perspective on what it's like to be more involved with the climate justice movement. We have the power to make change, and grassroots organizations like 350 Colorado are on the forefront of that change. The climate crisis can feel hopeless and paralyzing, 
Yet 350 Colorado and movements around the world are feeling more inspired than ever, ready to do what it takes to create a more just and sustainable future for us all. And Megan Neufeld, how are you today, young lady? I am doing very well. How are you? I am doing good. So how was this internship with 350 Colorado? It's been really, really interesting. I love it a lot. I have been working with 350. I started working with them um, in September of 2019 mm -hmm. when I was a part of the September 20th global climate strike. And so that's when I found out about their internships. And I just, I love the people in that organization. So it's been, it's been really good. That is awesome. Now, for those who may not know, share a little bit about the mission statement of 350 Colorado. What do they do and why is it important to everyday individuals on this planet? So 350 Colorado is a part of the global movement for climate action and they're working specifically in Colorado to create a fossil free future. So a lot of that is advocacy with the oil and gas industry and with local politicians just trying to move away from fracking and to renewable energy. And so that resonated or that's something that you have always liked. How did you get interested and even put in many ways a value stamp on this? Um, you know, it's funny because I feel like I don't really have a like defining moment that I was like, I'm really passionate about this, mm -hmm. but my dad is really involved with environmental advocacy. So I've sort of always known about climate change. And then when I got into high school, just seeing news reports, the constant stuff talking about how bad climate change has made me really anxious. So being able, like finding a way to be able to take action has really helped calm that anxiety and helped me realize that, you know, there are things we can do and ways we can get this issue under control. So, yeah. That's absolutely, no, that's, it's commendable and kudos to you. We certainly need people to know and learn and understand and appreciate everything that we have here. As I used to, when I was a little kid, I used to love a show called The Big Blue Marble. Um, and it says, you know, cause out in space, you look down and we look like a big blue marble. Um, and I can even hear the song in my brain, but understanding, um, understanding climate and understanding what it means to the safety and security of everyday individuals. How do you get people to digest even some of that, that this is real? Yeah, it's it's hard. Um, I think, you know, especially because some people are more affected by the climate crisis than others. So it's hard to really get it through to the people who are less affected. Mm -hmm. But I think especially this year's wildfires have really spoken to the people of Colorado and made made it clear that this issue will affect everyone, even us here in Colorado. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember a time where we had, you know, like hurricanes around Christmas or Thanksgiving. We're getting hurricanes still now. This season used to be over and it does make you stop and say, well, wait, wait a minute. If, yeah. if, you know, I just I find it amazing um, that you are really unlocking or at least delving into helping to unlock this kind of what we have. We need to appreciate. And so many times we don't have that unlocked. Yeah. Yes, that is definitely becoming increasingly important. Absolutely. When you talk to kids, young people your age, because you all are not kids, when you talk to them and they are maybe not naysayers, but they're, you know, they're not totally on board with whether it's climate change or just taking care of the environment and being really conscientious, how do you get them to kind of at least turn a corner with that? Um. It can be really difficult, but I think one of the most effective things I've learned is finding what's important to my friends or people that, you know, aren't as worried about climate change, like figuring out what's important to them and then connecting that to how it will be affected by the climate crisis. Um, because, you know, when you connect it to what people care about in their own lives, it makes them realize that 
they should care about the climate crisis too. That's absolutely right. No, that is very, very good. If you had to pick one word to describe this year, Miss May, <laughs> and don't say chaotic. They about beat your your classmates have beat that word to death. <laughs> be one word that describes this year. Oh, oh man. Okay, let me think. Um, <laughs> or maybe two. But give okay, me something okay. because I'm going to tell you, it's been, I mean, it's a myriad. It's, I've been amazed at some of the words they've come up with when I took chaotic off the table. Um, okay, okay. This one just came to me. I think a good word could be a year of reckoning. Hmm. Um, <laughs> there's That's been a lot of stuff that has happened that has maybe forced people to reckon with <laughs> what's going on. Right. Their choices, the consequences of those choices, and just where we are as a as a human race. That is yeah. very enlightening. Yeah. Very enlightening. Well, good luck with your future endeavors. I know that you are going to be really one of the voices that we need out there when we start talking about climate, climate change. I'm thankful that you are in the race, young lady. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. You are very welcome. Appreciate your work. Longmont, Colorado is by no means a very small town, but the community makes it feel like one. They always come together to support each other in times of need. I have had the privilege to grow up in this amazing community for 17 years, and I think it's my turn to help out, but I cannot do it alone. So, here's a little bit about me. My name is TJ Nicholas. This is Silver Creek High School, and my, no, our project is shirt off my back. Printing at an inexpensive price with quality shirts, logos, in a timely fashion. Partnering with local businesses, organizations, and charities. Empowering the people in the community to continue making a change. That is what the Shirt Off My Back project is all about. Printing, partnering, empowering. Next up is TJ Nicholas. So this t-shirt company, in support of the nonprofit and all these nonprofit organizations, how many nonprofits are you supporting with the shirt off my back? Um, so currently I've just kind of reached out to some nonprofits I haven't really partnered with any yet. Um, I'm looking to just help as many as I can. I mean, it's um, we print shirts one by one, and so it takes some time. Um, but I'm really just trying to help as many uh, nonprofits or like uh, organizations as I can. And so out of all of these helping the nonprofits, where was that born? What was it born out of? You said, you know what, there is a need. I want to help. Let me put these two together. And that's where, you know, you give birth to this. How did you give birth to this idea? Um, well, I mean, with this crazy year, um, it, I work for a really small local pizza place and I really showed like how people go and support like very local small businesses and organizations. Um, and my mom, uh, when I was growing up, she started her own accounting business. Um, uh, and so, uh, she learned everything she knew from one of her like very best friends who passed, uh, last summer due to a car accident. And, uh, she was, her name was Susan and her whole idea was help the little guy and just do whatever you can to help anybody. And so um, I've always learned to just like help anybody I can. And so I really wanted to help out the smaller guys and the smaller businesses and organizations. So that's why I kind of uh, came with this project is I want to connect my business side and my SCLA side to help out as many people as I could. Absolutely. No. And it comes through. But the difference is sometimes people see that there is a need and they don't help for a variety of reasons. But you have chosen to not succumb to that. Now, you are over the print shop at um, Silver Creek, right? Yeah. So um, right now I'm in an internship with the business teacher. And so I really just uh, I track inventory, I print the shirts. So uh, not only is am I doing my project out of there, but I'm also partnering with just the business department for Silver Creek and uh, going from there. Wow. 
No, that's really good. In addition to everything else you're doing, not to mention football practice. Let's see. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So the shirt off my back, as in a play on words, I'll help you by giving you the shirt off my back if I have to, in order to move this along. Do you think in many ways your project is a result of just the craziness that's going on in the country where people really just need to help one another and it can really help us all turn a corner. I think um, just seeing how everybody did help each other is really uh, kind of maybe could have helped my idea. But yeah, that's I really just want to keep that going. It's just, um, I mean, no matter who's watching, no matter who you're helping, just help anybody you can. And it doesn't matter if it's what making one shirt or making 50 shirts. That's I'm just trying to help as many organizations as I can just to kind of take some load off their back of not having to order $15 shirts from some retail. What has this project taught you about yourself? Ooh, um, I mean, it, it taught me I can't make many mistakes. I mean, when you're working with money and inventory, that's you know, the mistakes you make have to be very little. Um, so I would say attention to detail is one of them. And I mean, not only in the print shop, but like just with anything I do in life, like making sure that I, I'm just not breezing it by or just doing it one handed and yeah. um, trying to really put myself um, forwards with like giving 100 percent. And I think uh, communicating, I mean, working with a bunch of organizations really got to be on the top of your game for communicating. So working, I've been working a lot on that too. Oh, wow. No, that is excellent. Last question. If you had to sum up the year 2020 in one word, what would that word be? Wow. One word. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of something like, not like crazy. I mean, crazy is a good word, but. Um, crazy is a good word. <laughs> that's cra crazy is the only thing coming to mind or uh, your morals. I mean, it's really, it really shows who's doing things when no one's watching, who's just trying to, like, like I said, just trying to help. Yeah, um, you're even talking about character. Character yeah. is shown when no one is watching. That is a good word. That is a very good way because you described it. So if I help give you birth to the word, but you describe it, you are talking about your character is on display. Okay. Yes. Hmm. That is excellent. That, that was an excellent, TJ. That was a very hard question, but that was a good question. <laughs> yeah, I know everybody <laughs> said that. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of having the conversation. And thank you for allowing me to be you know, myself. And so it hopefully helped you be yourself because I really wanted to get at the essence of every single project because y'all have done some phenomenal things and each one of you are very unique in your walk in life. Um, and just, there is no other people your age who can say they went through the year 2020 unless they actually went through this at their respective high schools. Yeah. You all are a part of a very unique group. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I was thinking about it just the other day that, um, I mean, if I, when I grow older, the, no one else is going to have a story about their senior year in COVID and like right in the middle of it. So um, I, it's, it'll, it'll be interesting. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, TJ. Good Thank job. you. You are welcome. you about PE for all. Here are four things you need to know. One, my class is for special needs students for PE. Two, my class is mentor mentee pair ups. One is a typical student, one is a special needs student. Three, we work on goals together. And four, we work on life lasting bonds. These are some things that we do in PE, as well as some of basketball, unified sports, as well as some of the other special ed 
and special things in the community that happen on at Sulphur Creek. So here are some pictures and the video before this was something that actually happened in our class. Here are my social media and email if you want to get in contact. Sarah Ray Hall, you have just blown my mind with all the stuff that you did for the SDLA. I think this is going to be phenomenal. So share a little bit about yourself with me and your project. So my capstone is pers for special needs students and I am a special needs student, so it's important for me to have that. Well, I am so glad you could join us. You created a curriculum that dealt with what? PE classes for all kids with disabilities as well as traditional students partnering together. Talk a little bit about your project. So for me, I always had a hard time in PE. Like it was hard for me to go to PE. I typically would try to avoid going there. So what I thought of was this PE class where you had special ed kids and it's a little bit more set back. So it's not as fast paced. And you have a mentor that also helps you play the game which also kind of sets things back because the mentor helps you. Mm. And the curriculum right now isn't very far in the process, but we're hoping to have a bunch of different to, curriculum to have in, so that I can get in other schools. Oh, that is outstanding. And so is that based, I mean, you give birth to this idea, you think about how it sounds so simple, but yet this is kind of complicated when you think about matching them. How did you come up? How did you arrive at this? Because this is a great idea. So I knew I wanted to do something with special needs, but um, my project wasn't really going to work because of COVID. And they already had this for last year. And I'm like, hey, can I do this as a capstone? because it's not very common. Like this is the first kind in our district and then like Colorado. There's other schools that are especially prepared and like do this class prepared in their school because sure. they're special needs school, but there's nothing outside of that kind of school. Wow, no, yeah. that is that is absolutely wonderful. Is that what the field you wanna go into? Um, I kind of, so right now I'm either gonna go into the special needs field or the medical field, so. Oh, okay, so in the medical field, which area do you think? Um, I'm thinking nursing or something like that. Well, we need you, <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> we need you more than ever. It has been just a very trying time, you know, with all this that's going on. So the inspiration for your project, did it come from personal experience or did it come from you seeing something? Where did it come from? So I knew, my inspiration was my teacher had this this started and i'm like this is a really good idea like i should kind of put this together and so i talked to the teacher that's doing it as well as the main like the as well as the special ed teacher which is it's a co-talk class and we put it they put it together last year but i'm hoping to get it into other schools like i said so the goal is that's my goal where their goal is to make it better in the school. That is absolutely wonderful. If you had to describe to um, a teacher or to someone how it feels to be in your shoes in PE, in physical activity, how would you describe that? Most people would say they don't know or they would act like, you know, they can be empathetic, but unless they've walked in your shoes, they don't know. How would you tell them? See, for me personally, in a normal PE class, I would get hit with balls and stuff like that. So, like, I would have to sit in the corner when we're doing big recess time or, like, some of the games they play are really dangerous for kids like us. Mm -hmm. So, and, like, they have to have, like, bodyguards around certain kids because they will get hurt in the games we're playing. Mm -hmm. So, for us, it's really scary sometimes, and it's better for us to have a more calmer class yeah like we're focusing on yoga because it's easier and so and it helps with mobility which is some of these kids goals which is another reason we're in the class is that we do goals for both mentors and mentees oh that's excellent what's one of your goals one of my goals is being able to communicate with all types of people 
my teachers, the students, um, the mentors, just communicating with them all. You are truly a leader, young lady. You know that? Mm -hmm. You are definitely a leader because so many times, to your point, those individuals who are um, you know, sitting back in the corner or they're not. Um, when I was in high school, I always sought out my special needs students or my special needs fellow students because I being a student too, I didn't like how sometimes they were mistreated and people would try to look down on them. And so I always, my mother would always say to me, that is so beautiful. Why are you that way? But I always felt like I was the protector right? Because I didn't like, not everybody was cruel, but sometimes kids can be cruel. And so for you to take this on and even say, you know what, to pair up um, a student that doesn't have, you know, challenge, physical challenges to one that does or mental challenges, I think that that takes tremendous leadership. Right. So if I go into the special needs field, I'm going to be an advocate, which is similar to what you're talking about, where their voices are more heard because not every kid is heard. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, kudos to you. Last question. If you had to describe this year, the year 2020, in one word, what would it be? It'd be chaotic. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure stuff out and especially for the capstones and for like the stuff where you kind of need to be in person to do stuff now. You can't do some of that stuff that you would have originally done. Mm -hmm. Chaotic is a, a definitely, I think everybody is feeling that chaos. What's one more word? I think challenging because mm -hmm. you have to come up, go over so many challenges, but um, like I work in the food industry and right now I don't know if my work is going to get closed. So I'm hoping it doesn't, but it's challenging for those kind of situations. And there, like, uh, you, you are, you are a phenomenal inspiration. Thank you for all that you have done and will do in the future. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, Kids are forced to stay at home and work online every single day. This has an undoubtedly strong impact on mental health and it is no surprise that issues like depression and anxiety are on the rise in young children. My name is Madison Tilly and I have a deep passion for all things yoga. Growing up is not always an easy process and children often develop mental health issues at a very young age, especially during times of turmoil. The goal of my Young Yogi program is to reach as many children as possible and to spread the awareness and the benefits of yoga as a practice. By creating powerful videos where students can participate from home, I am confident that I will not only be able to achieve my goal, but I will be able to make a stronger community as a result of it. And next up, we have the wonderful Madison Tilly. It is so very good to meet you, albeit it is through this Zoom thing. But this year's project for the Silver Creek Leadership Academy, I'm sure it was very, um, how shall I say, unique. But talk to me about the yoga classes, the online yoga classes for elementary age children and how you came up with this by supporting the mental health of young folks. Yeah. So um, in SCLA 11, we were brainstorming what we wanted to do. And I was honestly in a pretty dark place with my mental health. And I had been doing yoga for a year up to that point. And I was, you know, really healing. And I felt that yoga was really helping me with that. Um, and so I discovered that maybe I could share that and share my journey and share that the benefits of yoga with, you know, younger students so they could discover it even earlier on than I did. Um, and I just love yoga and I feel like these videos are really going to help. And even though the coronavirus was unexpected, I feel like it was kind of a blessing for my project because kids, you know, are stuck on the online all day. And I feel like it's really going to help them to be able to take a breath and to get some physical activity in their day and to connect through yoga. So that was my idea. Well, I loved it because very similar to you and I had dibbled and dabbled in yoga. Mostly my stuff was in the gym 
But mm-hmm. I will tell you what really became so wonderful was the fact that yoga allowed me to breathe. And by that, I mean, doesn't it really allow you to take in something as simple as a breath and concentrate on that breath? Um, it really does teach you to listen to you, whatever's going on in your mind's eye, inside your brain. Yoga says that's you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. Talk a little yeah. bit about what that did for you and try to put it into words. It's so hard. Yoga it doesn't is. begin to describe what it can do for you. Yeah, absolutely. I just feel like that the mindfulness piece of it, like you said, is just so important. And whenever I walk into my studio, I could really feel that. And that's exactly what I wanted to share. So, and I, that's also what I'm going to be doing too, is some like breathing exercises with the kids and introducing them to that. And they could carry that with them wherever they go. So that's always a good tool to have. Do you find that young folks really, um, the messaging to younger people was left out of this pandemic about the struggle with mental health and it's taboo and people don't talk about depression. And it's like, are you kidding? If you are not depressed, something's wrong with you. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. It's a tough time right now. So I feel like it's good for kids to know that they're not alone and that what they're experiencing is what everybody else around them is experiencing. Cause even as a teen, it's hard, you know, I feel like other people might be doing things or having fun outside of me. And it's not true. Everybody's going through the same sort of struggle. So I feel like kids could really benefit from knowing that too. You know, yours is a very, very special gift because most people would not know to kind of encapsulate that and put it out there, especially even with middle-aged kids or excuse me, or elementary school kids, because Mm. I think once you teach them young, that just continues throughout their entire lives. You never know what you're unlocking. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, I feel like it's a gift. And I feel like, like I said, like the exercises that I'm going to be teaching are something that they could carry with them. And it's not just something that they're going to do when they watch the videos, but it's something that they could do in the classroom. If we go back on, you know, if we're back in school and outside of the classroom with friends and family. So. Right. Right. And it helped, I know it helped me to hear from other girlfriends who are saying, you know, well, I'm feeling kind of down too. Did it help you to hear from other teens your age who said, you know what, you were not crazy. I'm feeling this way. I can't describe it. Help me. Of course. Yeah. It's always good to have community and to feel that sense of community and to feel that sense of camaraderie between your peers. So I feel like that'll definitely help. Absolutely. Final question in one word, how would you describe or sum up this year? Oh gosh. I feel like it's a blessing, honestly. And I feel like even though they're very unprecedented and it's very hard, I feel like finding the positive in it is really good. So I would say it's honestly a blessing because I feel like we're all going to learn so much from this year. Mm. That's going to, you know, really help us develop ourselves and grow as human beings. So that's how I describe it. Excellent job, Madison. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Wait a minute. All of his footage is pre-pandemic. If this was shot right now, in the middle of a COVID-19 crisis, I'd be screaming at those grandparents to run. And for good reason. People above the age of 65 are almost 220 times more likely to die from COVID-19. That's why so many retirement homes have stopped allowing visitors. Oh, who am I? My name is William Van Buren and I'm a senior at Silver Creek High School. I've played with computers for all my life and for my project, I'm creating a program which utilizes technology to bring senior citizens and high school students together. This project is called Senior Citizens Connect. It collects writing samples from senior citizens and students and constructs a personality profile for each user. From there, an algorithm pairs up the seniors and students for a personalized letter writing experience. This is all in an effort to combat the negative effects which come with loneliness and social isolation. I'm adamant about this and I won't stop working on this project until this can return to looking like this. Next up, we have someone who once I really read about what he was doing and saw that it was going to be this connection with seniors, I was like, oh, this is going to be so great. So I'm talking about Mr. William Ben Buren. William, talk a little bit about Senior Citizens Connect and how you came up with that wonderful idea. Sure. Well, Senior Citizens Connect kind of came up as an adaptation of Letters from Raptors, which um, Miss Adams actually like started when coronavirus started, or at least the lockdown started. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of, I was working with a team from the St. Vrain Innovation Center, and we wanted to like submit an application to this competition called Call for Code, IBM's Call for Code competition. And basically, we just adapted um, 
letters from Raptors to become more personal and more tech based because we figured that it wasn't really like reaching its full potential. Right. So that's kind of how the idea started and how um, the infrastructure first started panning out. And yeah, I've just been rolling with it now. Well, it sounds wonderful. Now I understand you love tech. You are into technology, which is a very good thing. So getting people like me and you to team up with folks who, and I'm sure this was part of it, to send letters to people who normally probably wouldn't hear from folks who don't have anybody or there's somebody maybe separated from them because they may not be you know, in the best health and they're trying to get care and people couldn't go and visit like they normally could. Do you recognize what a huge difference that is making in the lives of everyday individuals? Well, yeah, definitely. I think that's part of the reason I've actually, you know, stuck with this project for so long and why I'm so passionate about it. Because I don't know, I have this philosophy to kind of, if you can make someone's day better, just you should always do it basically no matter what. And I feel like this project has the potential to kind of not only connect like an individual high school student with like an individual senior citizen, but also to create kind of a sort of tighter community in Lama, because these are two groups that don't really ever communicate, honestly, especially with like some senior citizen you don't even know. So I think it's really essential and it's really good to build this sort of community that, you know, doesn't really exist right now. No, you're absolutely right. It doesn't it doesn't exist and it is much needed. No question. In order for there to be a community, um, you know, no one should be discarded just because of their age. Everybody still has worth um, and they need to be upheld. And so kudos to you for doing that. Way Thank you. Lot. Is this walk, is this um, venture in this project, is this a field that you might be interested in going into in the future? Yeah, definitely. So not only like the technology aspect, which I'm planning to major in computer science in college, but also kind of the community, the community aspect, like outreaching and helping people. That's also something that I'm really interested in. Um, you know, I've just been passionate about doing community projects like every single moment I can, even if they're really little. I've always just been passionate about that. So I definitely want to continue that in, you know, college, um, just past college like for the rest of my life. Definitely. Yeah, that is outstanding. So you have had your finger on the pulse of so much that has gone on. Otherwise, you would not have been able to come up with this project and really give life to it, even mm -hmm. outside of Miss Adams. But talk a little bit about why this was so important to you as an individual. Sure. Well, I think... So I'm a first generation American, right? So both my parents come from, my dad's from South Africa, my mom's from China. So my grandparents obviously live on different continents and speak different languages. So I've never really had the opportunity to, you know, communicate and like come back every day after school and talk with like my grandpa or my grandma. Um, so I kind of, the reason why I've really gone so hard with this project is I want to give other people who may be in my situation the opportunity to create, um, you know, connections with elders and senior citizens, because I think it's a really good thing. And in my life, it's kind of felt like a missed like opportunity for myself. So I'd kind of like to create that for other people. Absolutely. If you had to describe this year in one word, William, and don't use the word chaotic <laughs> in one word, and that's only because your classmates have used it to death. How would you describe the year 2020? Well, um, in one word, I'd probably say inspiring. Because while I think there's a lot of, you know, negatives, like it's really chaotic, it's annoying and everything. I feel like all these bad events that keep on happening, you know, they're going to push us forward, right? Because you don't get better without, you know, experiencing failure, experiencing loss. So I think that all of this stuff is important. Not that it's like necessary good thing, but that it's important for, um, you know, pushing just humanity as a like society, as a collective group, just forward in life. Oh, that is excellent. And actually very insightful. Very, very insightful. You. you are very welcome. Very proud of you. And thank you for your time. Excellent project. Hi, my name is Logan Peter. For my senior capstone project for SCLA 12, I decided to partner with Sources of Strength, 
to make a series of short films based around the Sources of Strength wheel. I decided to call this project Slices of Strength. Each short film will be one to two minutes long and highlight a section of the Sources of Strength wheel. These include physical health, mental health, family support, positive friends, mentors, healthy activities, generosity, and spirituality. Logan Veter, as I read the synopsis for your particular project and what you were doing, number one, it takes strength and courage to do this. Um, these short inspirational videos to ask not only others, but also to be the source of strength and that source of strength wheel. One, where did the source of strength wheel come from? And two, not enough people talk about teen suicides and how it impacts those around those individuals who have committed suicide. Share your story and based on your project with me. Um, yeah, when I was a freshman in high school, I learned about sources of strength and um, I'm not exactly sure where the wheel came from, but I know that sources of strength created a long time ago. It's been running for a numerous amount of years. And I kind of used that freshman year. I've been through depression and stuff like that. Um, I've seen a lot of friends. I, freshman year again, I saw two friends attempt suicide, which was really hard for me. And then over the summer, I had a couple of friends who were struggling with depression as well as my sister. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind of choosing this project was a really good way to help people because I've seen how it affects people. I've seen how it affects me. So it is a good um, number one. It is a good time to take the lid off of all of the stigmatisms associated with depression. Um, as I was talking to my pastor a couple of weeks ago, and he, I mean, we had a good laugh. He said, if something, if you're not depressed, something's wrong with you <laughs> right now. It has been absolutely um, just unbelievable with the pandemic and just the challenges that we've had as a society. But what you are doing really does lend itself to the courage and passion that you have inside, where does that come from? I mean, you could have easily just said, you know what, this is something that's private or something and I don't even want to acknowledge. I'm not going to do any of the above. But instead you said, I'm not only going to shine a light on it, I'm going to make it my project. Um, yeah, I've always been kind of the person that all of my friends and family go to for help when they need something like that. If they just need to talk or they need to get something off their chest. Yeah. So I felt like if I wasn't the one that was putting it out there and getting it to more people, then I wasn't doing anyone justice. I felt like I needed to help more people. So, mm -hmm. Well, you are doing just that. And I understand the suicide deaths of friends and all of this being inspired by that. Where do you think um, you go inside of yourself and you talk about depression? Full disclosure, I'm very familiar with it. I too um, suffer from depression. I think if you really look at all of the instances of individuals, um, high individuals who have high performing, those who are very driven, those who are, and when things are not, not even so much the norm, but just all of the angst surrounding where we are today, a lot of times they don't perceive that young people are feeling the way that older people, I always beg to differ. I think in many ways you feel it more because of the uncertainty of where you are, what's my next, what am I gonna do with my life and all of that, and then, you type on all this other stuff. What can you say to those individuals who say, you know what, young folks don't understand? What do you say to that? Um, well, talking to a lot of my friends and seeing their perspective on depression and suicide, uh, a lot of them feel that they don't have a future. With the pandemic and everything, a lot of my friends have said, like, it doesn't feel like we're actually being able to grow up and become adults. <laughs> <laughs> I always um, love a dog. I always love a yeah. dog. Like, to me, that's the universal way like, of saying, laugh at it, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like um, for a lot of my friends that they don't have a future. And I've talked to a lot of people, especially when I had three or four friends all going through depression at once and yeah. two of them became prescribed. They told me that it didn't feel like they had a future. Um, and I think that that duality of we are the future as kids being the future of our nation and the world, I guess. Yeah. as well as not feeling like we have that is kind of what puts a lot of pressure on us. No question. No question. Well, you not only have a future, um, you give those who have been your age hope 
as we look at you and say, you know what, if they can handle it with all the uncertainty, what makes you think you can't? You should, because just as they are setting an example, you need to set the stage and set that example um, for them and take the stigma of depression and all of those challenges, especially now, off of us, each other, and say, it's okay. Have you found yourself doing that a lot with your friends based on this project, Slices of Strength? Yeah, I have. Um, I had a friend that I was planning on helping edit these videos, and I found out that she was kind of struggling with them. Mm. So I ended up just talking to her rather than about the project, about how it can help her, how she can help me. It became about how I can help her in that situation. It was really cool how that kind of flipped. Yeah, no, that is the good part. No question about it. In many ways, it's being a member of a different kind of team. You know, if they're all coming to you, you know, that's good and wonderful. That certainly speaks to the leader in you. But even the leader needs to make sure that he or she practices self-care. Correct? Mm -hmm, Definitely. All of those. And so what has your project taught you about Logan? Uh, (laughs) It's taught me a lot about how, I guess, hard work pays off more than just knowing things. Because I found a lot more about, or I found out a lot more about the SCLA wheel from just talking to people and um, kind of interacting with people who are like struggling with a specific area of the wheel. Mm-hmm. Then I have researching it and going through a lot of stuff like that. So, and what are some of the items on the wheel? There's physical health. There's mental health. There's mentors. Those are the ones that I've started so far, and I've mm-hmm. had screws for. Mm-hmm. Um, those are like kind of my favorites right now because it is such a mentor-based project, and then. I personally am a huge fan of physical health as well as that connection to mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, honestly, the physical health and mental health are very strongly linked together. And then along with that mentor piece, because I had a personal trainer as well, who was very into that connection. So those are the ones that have really interested me. So absolutely. No, it is extremely important. Last question. Summing up the year 2020. If you had to describe 2020 in one word, what would it be? Ooh, um, I'd say train wreck. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? That is fair. No question. (laughs) That is fair. Well, you know what, though, Logan? It's certainly you've taken that train wreck and you've turned it into something very positive. And I'm so glad you did that because you've done a great job. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Great job indeed. As our world evolves, so do our students. Our students become more aware of the harsh world around them as politics grow increasingly tense. But how are these future leaders expected to stay united in such a biased world? Civics with Sid aims to educate young students in Colorado and beyond about the world around them through an unbiased perspective on civics and government. As Malcolm X once said, education is the passport of the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. The sooner we prepare our future leaders, the higher the potential our world has of being reunited. Young minds are extremely vulnerable and often fall prey to biased perspectives. These curious minds deserve the chance to learn enriching and unbiased content in an age-appropriate way. Civics with Sid is my opportunity to make this change. Next up for this wonderful, wonderful event, we have Sydney Sid Walker. I love your project title, which was Civics with Sid. I thought, oh, now this is good. How did you give birth to that? I mean, where did that come from? Because the creative juices had to be flowing big time. Um, well, it was originally going to be like Civics with the Raptors or Civics and Government with the Raptors, but that wasn't very unique enough, I thought. So, you know, I started playing around with some names and then, you know, obviously some, since my name is Sid, Sydney, whatever, Civics with Sid just rolls off the tongue, you know, so I kind of thought that was a good name. So, you know, we went from there and I stuck with it. So if I am an alien and I'm beaming down to the planet because, you know, they have black aliens, too. (laughs) If I'm beaming down, (laughs) what would you say to get me to understand your project? I would tell you that my project is to educate younger students about uh, civics and government in the local community and uh, surrounding communities. I would say that everyone deserves the chance to 
learn about their government, and this is an opportunity for younger students to do that. Okay, so keeping that theme of being an alien, beaming down, being on planet Earth for the first time, how would you explain what civics means? Civics is the workings of the communities and uh, higher up authorities around us. Um, it can also be people getting together and um, making their community a better place. Do you think it's important for children who are elementary age to understand civics, even if they don't know exactly what that means? How do you get them engaged in that? I think it is extremely important for younger students to understand civics and government, especially with our ever-changing political climate today. They need to understand what is going on. They need to understand how these things work and why there's different sides. Um, yeah, how else do you want me to expand on that question? No, you can expand on it any way you want. So one of the things that I absolutely love about having these conversations, and I'm probably one of the most fiercest um, defenders of people who are younger than me, people who are in their late teens, 20s, 30s, um, and even sometimes 40s. But I think you you all are more aware and more um, engaged than a lot of adults give you all credit for. And so this idea to me just proves it. If you are saying cartoon civic lessons to put it in their language or meeting them where they are, and saying, you know, I want them to even know about this because it starts young. Yeah, for sure. And I think that civics and government is not just for adults. It's for everyone. It affects everyone. And we need to make it understandable and fun in a way for younger students to understand what it is, too. If you were a little kid and you were talking to an adult who needed to understand what you were seeing in this time in history, what would you say? Take yourself out of being a senior. If you were Sid, who were little itty bitty Sid, like you're, you know, seven and eight years old and you say, I need the adult, whether it's a mother, father, or it is a relative or even a teacher, I need them to understand what I'm feeling about this um, lack of civics or even I'll go so far as civility. How would you get them to understand what you are trying to convey? When I was younger, I'd say I was pretty uncertain about the topic of civics and government. I hated social studies. I thought it was the lamest thing in the world. I thought, you know, why do we have to learn this? But as I grew older, it was like, history changes every day. Like our generation and the generations behind us are changing history every single day. We need to make sure everyone can understand it in a way that we can all get involved. Do you have any aspirations to run for office? I do not plan to run for like major office. I've definitely considered like, um, I mean, local government, but I want to focus on um, like being a lawyer for students with disabilities. That's excellent. We need all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Pick one. We need all of that. And I'm saying pick one. And, and actually, you don't have to pick just one. Right. I believe in so much of what we do. We live in a this and that world. So mm -hmm. you can do whatever it is that that you want to do. In one word, sum up to me how you would describe this year. How I would describe 2020? Uh-huh. Ooh. Um, maybe growth. Hmm. Hmm. That's good. In other words, did we have to grow or are we growing or did you see enough growth? I'd say that, you know, this year has been crappy for all of us. We've all struggled this year, but I think as a community, we've tried to come together and grow. Um, even if it's the communities that are separated, you know, if it's the people that don't politically agree, we've all tried to come together to an extent and grow together. And sometimes it's, you know, meeting somebody new that you grow with. That's absolutely very good because it is hard to encapsulate. So yeah. thank you, great job. And I want you to be encouraged. And now I'm telling you, Sydney Walker, if we say Sid Walker for office, I'm gonna be looking for that name in the coming years. I'm just saying. <laughs> you better. That's right, because it all starts at the local level. It's not, you know, you say big office. Nobody runs for a big office. They all start locally, school board, city council, you name it, RTD, but all of that, be encouraged because we need you. 
Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Wow. I mean, there are so many other words I could use. Each and every one of you are so very inspiring. I, just the walk that we all have experienced with this crazy year, I think that word was used, but I think you all have really inspired me. And I know it never is intended that way, but that's what makes it even more sweet. I applaud each and every one of you students because your projects this year have taken on new meaning because we are in a pandemic. And because despite of that, you are still able to overcome and do what you need to do to get it done. That is, that gives me the hope that I need to be on this big blue marble. So once again, I've done this, I think three years in a row, every single year, never done it in a pandemic, never done it virtually, but because you all allowed me in yet again, I am blessed and the better for it. So thank you each and every one of you for doing what you do. Thank you to Carrie, or as you all know her as Ms. Adams, for even asking me back because you all are bridging a divide that many people hadn't even recognized was there. And that gives me hope for 2021 and beyond. Thank y'all and have a wonderful holiday season.